Um, welcome, week two. Uh, how many of you or who might remember our theme verse for this semester? Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. But I want to emphasize verse 14 um, to kind of get us thinking in the right direction. Verse 14, Paul writes to Titus, talking about Christ, and says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So when we talk about our Christian worldview, that's an important, yeah, Titus 2, verse 14. Um, that's an important aspect to realize that, yes, Christ redeemed us, but he also, in that aspect of redeeming us, um, is, is, is an attempt to purify us from every lawless deed which would be our actions, um, but also develop a people who were zealous or desirous of doing good deeds. And all of that's going to stem from your Christian or biblical uh, worldview. Uh, if you weren't with us last week, we used the term Christian or biblical worldview synonymously, even though there might be some discussion about the differences um, in this class for this purpose. Uh, we'll use those synonymously. So we did a little introduction last week. Um, I challenged you to begin writing out your Christian worldview. Did anyone come up with something specific that, that, upon putting it on paper, struck you that you would feel free to share with us this evening? And if not, that's okay. Um, but since I mentioned it last week, does anybody have something they want to well, share. I wrote something, but I'm not sure whether I copied it out of some place or if it was mine. That's okay. okay. A Christ-centered view of the world because of our faith and belief that Jesus Christ is a true Son of God. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that goes along exactly with what Titus 2.14, Paul was mm -hmm. writing, that because Christ gave himself for us, he redeemed us. And so as a result of that redemption, then, our worldview, our actions... <laughs> Our words, our thoughts, everything needs to be, needs to come from that perspective. And so we talked about that last week. We talked about that perspective of a worldview and that everyone has a worldview, whether you acknowledge it or not. Um, just like the fact, and I don't remember who originally said this, everyone has a theology, whether they recognize it or not. Everyone has a view of God. Um, so... Uh, thanks for sharing that. Let's pray, and we'll jump right into uh, chapter 2. Dear God in heaven, we do thank you that Christ redeemed us. And Father, we thank you that part of the fruit of that redemption is the change that you're working in and through us. And so God, as we talk worldview, as we talk fundamental life principles, God, help us to see and know and act in a way that would be in line with Christ, in line with your word, uh, so that we might impact the world in which we live. So we thank you for that. I thank you for these that are here, and I ask that you would direct our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So opening up in chapter 2, we see the idea, welcome, uh, we see the idea of a worldview being that in the second full paragraph, the opening of chapter 2, a worldview is a framework or set of fundamental beliefs through which we view the world and our calling and our future in it. And if you remember last week, we introduced different aspects of a worldview. And our worldview should answer all the questions that somebody might have. Why are we here? How did we get here? Why are there problems in the world? Okay, when you hear questions like that, are you immediately thinking of answers? Well, we're here because God created us. There's problems because of sin, because of humanity's sin. I mean, so our biblical or Christian worldview should be those foundational principles in our life upon which we base our life, but then they sh that our Christian or biblical worldview should also be able to answer all of those fundamental questions that human beings have. Why are we here? What's our purpose? Well, again, according to Scripture, our purpose is that everything that God created was created to glorify God. And so that's our purpose as to why we exist. 
And so, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, so, all of that plays into that, what Riken is calling our framework. And it should be a framework based upon fundamental beliefs that we have. And he's really going to deal with some theological aspects of a Christian worldview in this chapter. Hopefully you had a chance to read it, uh, because we're going to brush through those. But not only should that be the framework of our fundamental beliefs, but it should be the way then from that foundational framework that we see everything else. That we view the world around us, how we live in the world around us, how we answer the questions that this world asks, all of that should come as a result of that fundamental framework of our Christian view. And at the top of the next page, he mentions creation, he mentions the fall, he mentions grace, he mentions God, God's glory, introducing this idea of different biblical fundamentals that we need to build our Christian worldview Upon, And it's important that we gain this perspective, in particular, in regards to, first off, creation. I would say, from my observation, feel free to chime in if you see, see or notice differently. I would say, the human beings who struggle with the purpose of why we're here, how did we get here, why are there so many problems in the world... I can almost guarantee you they don't have a biblical view of creation. In fact, everyone that I've talked to who struggles with those issues, that doesn't mean when you're a Christian you don't struggle with those issues, but how much greater still... I mean, let's just play this out. Philosophically, if you truly believe that we evolved from some primordial ooze... Then where is the the priority of life, being a human being? I mean, think about it. We're all just in some chain, and that might eventually evolve into something else. But think that through. Whereas in creation, what does the Bible say? We're created in God's image. So that stamps every human being, even those who would deny the existence of God. It stamps them with a specific and special aspect of their being, being created in the image of God. But see, if you don't start there, if you don't have that basic fundamental view, then yeah, I can see why people don't see human life with any value. That seems obvious to me. I don't know if you've experienced otherwise. But that clearly seems obvious to me. So this aspect of creation... Um, well, what's wrong with this world? Well, I don't want to oversimplify, uh, but the Bible makes it clear in Genesis chapter 3, sin and the curse that came upon creation as a result of sin. I mean, again, I don't want to oversimplify it, but you really can track every ailment in this world back to that. But, if that's not your view, where do you go for answers? What, what do you use as a foundational framework? So I hope you're seeing, as he's pointing out, this clear distinction between someone who would have a biblical or Christian worldview as opposed to someone who's really just kind of grasping at straws and the difference that places upon human life, the difference that places on, on the view or the, a worldview of why this world's so messed up. Um, and then naturally... Salvation or redemption, like we read earlier in, in uh, Titus 2.14. God wasn't overcome <laughs> by how we as human beings have messed everything up. He had a plan. What was his plan? He sent, he, he sent his son. He sent his son, exactly. But again, if you don't have that as a basis for your view of the world... That's why people are so hopeless. I mean, let's just be honest. I'm looking around this room, all of us in our adult lifetime. Name a politician that has fulfilled your hope. <laughs> Name when the stock market has fulfilled your hope. If you were alive in 2008, 2009 with any kind of investment, I guarantee you, you won't name the stock market. 
as your hope. I, I mean, but you see what I, and I think that should bring us to not only a greater appreciation of, of having the truth of God as a foundational framework, but give us a greater empathy for those who don't have that. Because there is no hope. There is no value of human life. There is no future. Why do I have a hope in the redemption of Christ? Because um, this ain't it. This isn't the end. Okay. There, there's a future. There's a hope. There's an eternity living in the presence of God the Father because of what Christ has done. But again, think of it in, in the perspective of people who don't have that. Where's the hope? Yeah. Okay. So all of those aspects are what he calls these four stages of humanity or human history tell a complete and unified story that stretches all the way back to the beginning and leans forward into eternity. So those of us who know, we can go all the way back to the beginning biblically and, and answer all those questions. And then in the meantime, we do have a hope and we can also look forward <laughs> and say, there is a future that's made for us. Um, I like what he says at the top of page 35, and I think this is a key to understanding the importance of a biblical or Christian worldview. He writes, we find our story within God's story, and our narrative within his master narrative. Okay. I mean, you think about that again. If you don't have the Bible as your basis for why everything exists, your story is just floating out there in space somewhere. When you understand who God is, what God has done, God's redemption in Christ, and God's future promise, well, I plug right in here. You know, and and two thousand years ago, the earliest apostles and church members, they plugged in two thousand years ago. But eventually, in eternity, <laughs> we're all going to be together for those who have faith in Christ. And so that's how my story, your story, the earliest Christian's story, how it all plugs into a master plan, master narrative of God. And so, again, we're going to, we're going to brush you through some theology um, that he points out is, is important in forming our biblical or Christian Worldview. He begins the next or the second paragraph of the next section talking about um, Marxists and other materialists that believe there is no God at all. Atheists who would claim that there's no God at all. Again, then where will their hope be? Um, he doesn't mention it specifically, but he does say, like Buddhists believe that human beings have to endure this earthly fate so that they will eventually get to that state of nirvana. Do, do, you, do you know what nirvana literally means? Mm -hmm. Nothingness. That's the literal definition of the word. Okay. Yeah, where's the hope there? Where's the hope there? What did Jesus tell his disciples in John chapter 14? I go to prepare a place for you, and I'll come again and take you there. I mean, that's a paraphrase, but that's what he said. So, my hope isn't an eventual state of eternal nothingness. My hope is in the glory of being around the throne. And there's even religious views. I've had one particular person of a particular religious view that said, well, no, you won't be in heaven. There are only the 144,000 will be in heaven. I said, well, you can understand the Bible all you want. Jesus said he's preparing a place for me, and he's going to come back and take me there. Yeah. So if you don't want to call that heaven, you call it whatever you want. I'm going to be in the presence of Jesus. <laughs> Plus, they don't read that entire chapter of Revelation where John describes the 144,000. And then a couple verses later, he describes a throng that cannot be numbered. And so I tried to get this person to see, okay, I may not be part of the first 144,000. I'll be in the throng. <laughs> so you can call it what you want, but... But even somebody with a religious view, I mean, like I have, where's the hope in that? My hope's in Christ. Um, he doesn't put a whole lot of uh, emphasis on it, but I think you can summarize 
especially in our culture and in our day and age, the emphasis on humanism. Humanism is a religious view. And to summarize it, humanism is the view that if all of us humans do enough good, we can change the climate. We can change the world. Let me tell you, climate, the climate alarmists are humanists. I truly believe the Bible teaches us to be good stewards. So I'm not talking about don't be a good steward. I'm talking about, though, if you think that we stop doing whatever they think we need to do, or we start doing whatever they think we need to do, yeah. then, then the climate's going to turn around and the climate's going to change. <laughs> Good luck with that. Okay. But see how humanism is just that. It's human-centered. I've got to be honest with you. I've known enough human beings in my life, I don't see the hope in what human beings can do. I don't see it. Um, so I think that's an important aspect in regards to worldview. At the bottom of that page, he says, what unifies the Christian worldview is not merely an idea, but the being and character of Almighty God. So again, where are you going to get the proper concept of God? Right here. Right here. Does that mean I understand everything about God? Absolutely not. But i got to tell you, that's part of the thrill to me of knowing about God. Because if I could understand everything about God, it wouldn't be a very big God. I mean, and especially the number of people who have called me pea-brained. If I'm pea-brained and I can understand God, that's a pea-God. <laughs> so... Again, coming back to just the wonder, the awe, um, all that we can gather from Scripture about God. And at the top of the next page, I believe he makes a statement that is a must in our understanding of God, especially, I'm at the top of page 36, how he views or how he portrays our view of God. It's in the middle of that first partial paragraph. God is always... Our ultimate frame of reference, the supreme reality at the center of all reality, the be-all and end-all of everything. If you don't start there, even as a Christian, sadly, I don't, I'm not convinced every Christian believes that statement. But if you don't start there as a Christian, then you're even going to be limited. It's even going to be a struggle for you. Do things happen that we don't understand? Certainly. Certainly. But my comfort is in the fact that God is so much greater than I am, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to understand. There, there's somebody who already knows. Mm -hmm. um, there's somebody, if you were in our previous uh, class, remember the illustration about the movie director? Mm -hmm. The guy who was running down the beach? And he saw a woman getting attacked by a shark, and he's screaming for somebody to help her. And as he runs up the beach looking for help, he sees the camera, the lights, and the guy sitting in the movie director's chair. So she wasn't really in danger. They were filming a movie. But it's the movie director who knows the whole story, and knows how things are going to turn out. And, knows, and I thought that was a great illustration of this idea of God's the one who's in charge. He's the be-all, end-all, do-all. And so, I'm okay with not being able to answer every question. I'm okay with... Why? Because my comfort is not in knowledge. My comfort is in relationship. And in that relationship, it's a relationship with God who, again, like we read earlier in Titus, Paul reminded us, Christ came to redeem us. Christ came to redeem us. That... that God at work and wanting to impact my life. So I think, I think that's important, um, that if you don't have at least that perspective um, in regards to God, even as a Christian, you're, you're going to be frustrated and you're going to be um, you know, lacking in regards to your worldview. Um, the middle of the next page, he talks about the Christian worldview does not begin 
with God as we would like him to be. And he puts in quotes, the God of my understanding. See, if he's the God of my understanding, he's not the God of the Bible. Because what did I say just a few minutes ago? If I can understand him, he's not much of a God. Okay? Instead, Christianity begins with the God who is really there. And you've heard me say that. I'm looking around this room. I think all of you have heard me say this. The Bible isn't a book about us. The Bible is a book about God. And so our study and use of the Scripture should grow our appreciation for who God is and what God can do. Notice I said our appreciation, not necessarily our understanding. I can't tell you why my father passed away at such a young age. can't tell you the why. Here's what I know. I have no doubt that he had faith in Christ, and I will see him again. That's what I know. I know that from Scripture, because I know that anyone who's gone on before me that God has redeemed, and anyone who would come to Christ after me, I'll see him again. <laughs> what a great assurance that is. I can't answer the why it happened, but I can tell you what's going to happen. We'll see each other again. I have no doubt about that. But it's because of who God is and what God has done. There's my comfort in regards to a biblical or Christian uh, worldview. And so as we've mentioned already, think of other worldviews, especially people who don't have any belief, perspective, or knowledge of God. Where's their hope? And I think you look, go ahead. Somebody started it has something. to be in themselves, actually, because mm -hmm. it's their hope that they would determine they see or believe. Yeah. Without and I think it's evident, I think it's evident that we can see the hopelessness mm -hmm. when human beings only hope in themselves or another human being. Um, I heard on the news today they captured that guy who's been on the run for two weeks, a convicted murderer, all that kind of stuff. Um, it was interesting in the news report that I saw there were interviews of people who lived in the area where they said he had escaped from. And one woman said, you know, I haven't been able to sleep at night. Because I know, I can understand that perspective. I don't, I don't know whether she was a Christian or not. But I can understand that perspective because if a if a guy's been out of had broke out of prison two weeks ago and they still hadn't found him, you think of all the resources that law enforcement has. Yeah, there's a reason to be concerned. Okay. But there's people who have broken out of prison and never gotten captured. So make sure your hope isn't just in law enforcement doing you know doing what they're set out to do. And so I think that's important. In regard. So it's the God of the Bible, not the God of my understanding. It's the God of the Bible upon whom I want to build this framework for my view of this world. The top of the next page, about the middle of that first partial paragraph. Again, kind of a re emphasis of what he had said about God being the be all, end all, and do all. He writes, the biblical God is utterly and absolutely sovereign. That's why it doesn't bother me when I can't ask questions, when I can't answer questions. Because I'm just going to trust, hey, God's in control. Even if I can't answer, why did this happen? Or why is that happening? Or how did that happen to that person? You know, whatever, whatever the circumstance, I just I guarantee you. And just as a note of personal advice, if somebody says they can answer all those questions, that's someone I would run from. <laughs> when, when somebody tells you, I got all the answers, that, that would be a person I would purposely avoid. Because <laughs> if they really think that, then they obviously don't know the God of the Bible. Okay. So, again, just that that emphasis on understanding the absolute and utter sovereignty of God. And again, without that view, at some point your personal theology and your personal worldview is going to crumble. Because something will happen. 
that you don't have an answer for. And again, that takes us full circle back to the hopelessness of people who only hope in people or themselves. Because they can't answer questions like that. I may not be able to answer it, but I know who's in control. So I'm not as, con you know, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I'm, I'm not concerned about it. The one true and living God is triune. So he, he spends a little time talking about the Trinity, one God and three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it is, as Riken calls it, a profound mystery. Vince went through this in his ordination. I went through this in my ordination. He was asked, one of his ordination questions was to explain the Trinity. I will not forget um, my personal ordination. One of my seminary professors was part of the ordination council, and he asked me to explain the Trinity. Now, this is the guy, some of you heard me say, you know, he didn't even carry an English text of Scripture. Have you ever heard me tell, talk about Dr. Fisher? He only carried a Greek text of the New Testament. And he read it on the fly in English. Okay, so this is a guy with some smarts. Okay. He asked me to explain, and I did the best that I could, and then I kind of stuttered and stammered. I'm a young man facing all these men that I looked up to in the faith, and after, I, it seemed like an hour, but I'm sure it was just a moment or two, he said, don't worry about it. Nobody else can fully explain it or understand it either. You know, and this is one of the smartest men I've ever known. And I'm thinking, what a great reassurance that even Dr. Fisher can't explain, you know, the Trinity. Why do I say that? Because that's how incredible God is. That's how incredible God is. And I believe that was the point he was trying to make. So in, in talking about the triune God, um, I think that's important as an aspect of orthodox Christianity. All of us in this room can think of religious groups that don't believe in the Trinity. So they can say whatever they want. They are not Orthodox Christians. Because all the way back to the original apostles, the Trinity has been a part of Orthodox Christianity. The, the apostolic fathers, the early church fathers, through I, I mean, you, you can't look at church history and ignore this belief in the triune God. Not only did Jesus represent it, you know, after Jesus was baptized, what did the Father say? This is my son. Okay. And then who did Jesus say he was going to send? The Holy Spirit. I mean, I've heard all the arguments, oh, the word Trinity is not in the New Testament. Okay, No, it's not. But the concept drips off the pages. Okay. So it's, it's important. It's an important aspect of our uh, belief in God. And then I like at the bottom of page 39, underneath that illustration, um, kind of in the middle of that next paragraph, from everlasting to everlasting, there is one true God who exists as an intimate fellowship of three co-equal and eternal persons, a God who finds infinite delight in the glory of his own being. You know, that's what Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. He prayed about the love that the Father has had for him in all of eternity. Um, Chris Morgan was the first one I heard say it. It may not be coined with him, but the Trinitarian love. The love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You can read John chapter 17. You can see Jesus praying about that. Okay. There is a love relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, beyond my limited ability to not even fully comprehend the Trinity, that's the love that Jesus promised to those who are followers of his. Think about that. So, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had a Trinitarian love amongst themselves. I mean, how mind-blowing is that? More mind-blowing than that is the fact that that's what... God has for us. We get to enter into that. So when Jesus, prior to John 17, says, if you love me, keep my commandments, that's a relational statement. 
That's not, a, that's not an if-then statement. That's not Jesus saying, you have to do this to be my love. The love's already there. <laughs> and, and what do you desire to do for those whom you love? What do you desire to do them, for them, towards them? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you really love someone, there's no end. There's no end to what you're willing to do to let them know. In, in that loving response. That's what Jesus was saying in John chapter 15 when he talked about obeying. Um, he goes on in the next uh, page, page 40, that middle section, he is not silent. Um, he mentions, again, this is, these are two theological concepts, that bottom paragraph on page 40, that God has spoken to us both in general revelation of creation and special revelation of his word. Um, Psalm 19 tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God. Um, I don't know if these last few nights, or I walk in the mornings, and you've probably noticed our days are already getting shorter. At 6 o'clock in the morning, it's still dark outside. You know, two months ago in the middle of the summer, it wasn't. But the eastern sky I mean, this morning there was just a crescent moon. I meant to look it up, which planet, because it was huge compared to the rest of the stars and how bright it was. And I just, I look at that and I'm like, wow, I'm awed. I'm awed. And, and that all points to the glory of God. That all points. So that's creation's general revelation of God. It's amazing to me that an honest person would look at, I don't know, go to Zion. We were at Zion Saturday afternoon because JT, who was here visiting, had never been to Utah. I said, well, you can't come to Utah and not go to Zion. You're this close. We went out to Zion Saturday afternoon. He was in awe. You know why? Because there ain't nothing like that in Kansas. <laughs> Toto. No. No. <laughs> there, ain't, there ain't nothing like that. There ain't nothing like that in Missouri. Yeah. Okay? I mean, that's where he did most of his growing up. Yeah. And, and, and it was kind of thrilling to see his face. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I was looking at the same sights he was, yeah. but I've been there plenty of times and it still thrills me. Yeah. But to see somebody's face who was seeing that for the first time, yes. and you're like, yeah, you're getting a glimpse now, brother. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A glimpse of what? A glimpse of just... The outer edge of the glory of God. Because yeah. that creation is revealing that the creator has made something like Zion or the mm -hmm. Grand, or you know, you, you guys know all the sights, look up in the night sky, whatever it is. Mm 